okay and that we've been doing in the park um, through the alliance and also way back when we were the friends of Van Quillen Park and there's going to be a lot of information here um, I'm going to be summarizing a lot of these different projects um, so any more detailed information or question that you guys have you could feel free to either ask or, or email me my email will be supplied and so So just starting off, I'd like to acknowledge um, we do get funding from a lot of different resources. So we'd like to just start off by acknowledging the DEC um, through the Environmental Justice um, Community Impact Grant uh, Program. There's also the Invasive Species Grant Program that we've benefited from greatly. Um, help from different uh, professors and other scientists in the community, such as Dr. Jessica Wilson, Dr. Paul Mankiewicz, who has helped a lot with our water quality programming, Dr. Yelda Pakir, who has brought a lot of students and has given us a lot of internship and classroom time over at Manhattan College, and Dr. Yuri uh, Grokovic over at uh, Leland College, who's in the Earth Science Department, GIS, and he's helped us a lot with looking at soils and has worked closely with John through his, um, his research over at Leland, and Dorothy Petit, who's helped out with uh, some paleoecology stuff there's been there's an endless amount of, of people to acknowledge but these are the kind of the people and then down at the bottom we can see kind of the organizations that are lending us to help actually complete this work so there'll be a couple of different topics that we'll run through first we'll go through our water quality program um, we'll be talking a little bit about chemistry and the dynamics of the chemistry uh, we'll talk about the reports that we produced and also some new um, research that I've been kind of messing around with in the field of paleoecology. Also be talking about aquatic biodiversity. So we've been working, going through Tibbetts Brook, looking at the benthic macroinvertebrate diversity throughout the system, also within um, the Hester Imperial Pond. And we've got a lot of interesting mathematical and computer models now where we're beginning to be able to predict um, why we see particular families, the number of families we do, um, the abundances that we see them. So we're starting to understand the community ecology through a predictive lens using the water quality data. Also terrestrial biodiversity, we've been going around the forest, really interested in the arthropod community. Um, it's these little things, as Ed Wilson would have said, that uh, run the world. And so, um, looking at things like the ants, the beetles, the spiders, these things are pretty much completely unknown. And so um, the work that I've been doing is kind of elevating our knowledge, our lack of knowledge to something close to what we know about the plants and birds in the park. Um, also, we've done research in the geochemistry because we're so intimate with the plants um, and plants are so intimate with the soil that we figured that would be actually a good thing to start to understand the elemental composition of the soil. So we've started to do that. Um, be talking about a restoration study with Japanese knotweed utilizing a technique called solarization. So that's uh, a technique that we are not using any sort of uh, herbicide sprays, um, which is a typical method for the removal of knotweed. So I'll be discussing some non-chemical um, potential mechanisms for removing knotweed and we've got some pretty good results. Um, and if you guys want to talk about mycology, email me. Um, don't think we'll be able to get to that, but there's some interesting stuff in the works with that. Um, and the New York Mycological Society is always a great resource. So I also want to just shout out to a bunch of the different schools that we also work with. Um, being a community organization, we are um, not just working with, uh, you know, other environmental scientists and other foresters, but we are also heavy on getting people to learn science through doing science, um, which I think is one of the only ways you can do it. And so we've reached out and we've worked with people at Fieldston and the programs at Wave Hill, Manhattan College, SUNY Oswego, NYU, colleges in France, um, host those community college Lehman and also we have the reoccurring VCPA eco teams which sources students from from all over um, just shouting out to a couple people that have been extremely helpful over the years um, doing 
all, all sorts of work and volunteering. And uh, so that's our community scientists and that's Benny and Felicity and Nick and Diana and Debbie. And, and we've also had a slew of student scientists um, that were in there as well. And I also just, although Noel, you're not technically a student, um, I thank you as well, if you're listening. So on to water quality. We've been doing this for a while and now we actually have some, I think, interesting results. So basically you, doctor sticks his needle into your arm and he draws his, your blood and then he looks at your blood and then he tells you whether you're gonna die or not based on looking at your blood. And that's kind of what we're doing and we're essentially using these streams as these vascular systems that run through our urban areas. And by going in and dipping into them and taking out a sample and looking at the chemistry, we could really have a greater understanding of what's happening to the whole ecosystem as a whole. And so some of the things that we're looking at are things like the pH, the conductivity, the temperature, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, nitrate, ammonia, and total phosphorus. So all these different, um, chemical uh, parameters that have influences on how animals develop, uh, the rates at which they develop, um, basically how ions move across membranes. Um, and so all this chemistry has a great influence on what's living there. Um, and so those are the things that we're measuring. In particular, we're interested in things like looking at what is an optimal sampling strategy. We were actually able to publish a paper in 2019 that described a kind of a mathematical methodology for um, optimizing where to sample, how many times should you sample. Um, and that was actually just recently cited. Um, so that's, that's a, a, it, it's it, basically the information that we uh, came up with showed that high frequency um, sampling is not necessary, that you end up statistically with very similar results with a lower frequency um, sampling um, procedure. We're also, I'm extremely interested in the dynamics of the, of the nutrients. And so moving forward, uh, we'll be hopefully getting students to begin to do some pretty interesting time series modeling. So we have our nine locations. This, the picture on the left is the sample locations. The yellow line shows the watershed boundary. So basically you can think of all rain that's happening within that area is going to go into uh, Tibbetts Brook and Hesser Imperial Pond uh, Lake there. Um, and it's a fairly uh, decent sized watershed. You'll see the different um, sampling locations are noted by the letters got A through I here. And there are just a lot of different um, things happening in this watershed that make it interesting to look at uh, the chemistry. So for instance, we've got um, different uh, number, a number of culverts and a number of stormwater outfalls. So all of these are going to influence the amount of light and photosynthesis that's able to have in those areas where we have our our culverts and also the amount of uh, nutrient and other uh, elemental inputs that are coming through things like stormwater outfalls. Um, this is a zoning map. These maps uh, were produced by John. Um, you'll see that also we've got pretty heterogeneous uh, land use around the system. Uh, it's predominated um, by the residential area, but we also, as you can see, have commercial manufacturing um, in the watershed. And these are uh, land uses of concern because of the industry, industry that goes on in those areas. So just some, to summarize the nutrient data that essentially for things like phosphorus. So, well, first I'll describe eutroph eutrophication as like, we all probably know it. I know you all know it, but I'm going to describe it anyway. So the idea is that you get a lot of nutrients that are inputted into your aquatic system. Now that causes a great 
uh, increase in the amount of uh, plant matter that ends up uh, developing in there. And towards the end of the season, that plant matter becomes fodder for all the microbes to begin to break it down. And because microbes are aerobically respirating for some of their time, they are, by decomposing that plant material, they're dropping oxygen levels down. And once you drop oxygen levels down to a certain point, you see some pretty big phase changes in your ecosystem. So basically, if we, we don't want our systems to be eutrophic. However, when we look at things like phosphorus, okay, that the level, the concentration level that phosphorus is in the lake, 100% of the time it's elevated over the standards for eutrophication. Nitrate is 98, 96, nearly 100% um, of the time. And oxygen is about a, a little quarter to a less of, of the time. Um, so what this is telling us that we have um, a huge input of phosphorus and a huge input of nitrogen that's going into our system. Um, so much so that there is really no point that we can go in and sample and it not be below what are the regulations. And on the left, you'll see some of the dynamics, but more importantly, I think this information is to note that this information was recently put into the Harlem River watershed uh, plan um, for the Bronx. And our discovery of basically a full-time eutrophication is hopefully going to push um, restoration efforts uh, forward for, for the system. And if you'd like to read uh, more about it, please see the uh, Harlem River watershed plan. And just, this is just, um, lo again, looking at phosphorus at across all the different sites. And here, when we're looking at this, we're trying to figure out, okay, is there any particular site that's more impaired than another site? And you can see here that B has a fairly high, um, much higher relative than um, concentrations than the other sites, um, which points to us that site B should be of concern for, um, for restoration in the future. This is data just to also mention that we have looked at metals in the past. Um, and this is uh, basically uh, data showing that there is not only differences in metal concentration of iron um, from site to site, but it's also a temporal phenomena. So it's, it's changing from month to month to month, which is interesting. And I would like to think and uh, do more work on that front. Uh, so moving into another sector of water quality. We have the work that I've been kind of doing with in the field of paleoecology. And what you'll see in the picture on the right is a core. These core samples are about 50 centimeters long. Uh, at the top there, I have it noted is the present. So that's all towards the top and down towards you have the past. These are structured stratigraphically. Um, so you're literally, as you go down, when you're taking these samples, you're going back into the past. Um, and something that we're kind of interested is, well, how do we take this information and apply it to restoration? Um, because restoration, we wanna guide an ecosystem to along a particular trajectory, um, but it's gonna be very helpful and to understand what was that previous trajectory in order to guide future restoration. So I really think um, I'm excited to see how one we can apply this uh, paleo data to um, to guide restoration in the future. I did have a student intern this uh, past summer looking at um, a bunch of the diatoms and, and basically the microfossils that could be found in the sediments. And she was able to find a couple of diatoms that are specific to eutrophic waters with the idea now that we would be able to go down into the core and find, you know, does that diatom exist throughout the entire core? Does that diatom exist throughout the entire history of Tibbetts Brook? Um, if not, then we could point to a, a point where the nutrient conditions were lower and it wasn't in eutrophic conditions. So we're 
moving forward looking to use diatoms as indicators. And the picture on the right is actually a microplastic. Uh, we started to find a lot of microplastics in the core, um, which made me think um, also that we could reconstruct microplastic uh, pollution history uh, by using these uh, paleoecological techniques. Um, and I would love to have somebody um, take that on. Uh, again, this is what some of the cores look like. Uh, this is from the brook. You could see that it's not homogenous, that you can see that there are darker spots. The granularity of the actual sediment itself changes. And so we're looking at a fairly dynamic system. And so there's a lot of history to un 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 uh, unwrap here. And lastly, this is um, basically um, looking at the amount of organic matter material um, starting down near 800, um, going up towards zero, towards the present, 800 being the past. We can see that over time, uh, we've had quite an increase of organic material and our present day um, top layer in the lake is hovering close to 90% organic material. And so this, this type of information would be useful for dredging and um, restoring the, the sediments in, in the future. So next we'll be talking about the aquatic biodiversity and some of the research we've been doing there. This research is very well linked to our um, nutrient and uh, water quality data. So for during the 2019, went to those nine different sites that were shown in the watershed map. And we placed these um, things called leaf packs. So essentially we took a bunch of onion bags and we placed a specific about 20 grams of dried uh, 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 pin oak leaves um, and uh, red and uh, I think two, two different species of oak um, and place two of these packs at each of the nine sites uh, for, an, uh, at, for basically almost every month for an entire year. And what we were able to do with that is we were able to pair what we were finding inside those leaf packs with the chemistry that we were also recording at those same locations at the same time. Um, lastly, we were hoping that this work would also help us find priority conservation locations within Tibbetts Brook. Um, if we found a particularly rare species, uh, that would give us um, a reason to go to that location and start working. Again, our objective was just to understand first the abundance and distribution, but also to begin to actually model and map the habitat ecology of these organisms. So our basic results just have our most abundant families within the system, within Tibbetts Brook. And it says VCL, but now it's the Hester and Piro Pond. Are the crustaceans and midges, so midges being um, both non-biting midges, which are the chironomids, and biting midges, which we do find a lot of black flies. So it's crustaceans of basically your isopods and your, your amphipods. Um, dominate with your chironomids and your black flies. And those were the ones that showed up most in our leaf packs. Um, however, we also did find a lot of uh, predators, that being odinates or dragonflies and damselflies, um, to the point where future research concentrating on odinates, um, I think will really come up with, with a, a list of species that should convince the city to turn uh, this area into a dragonfly conservation area, but one could one could wish. Um, and also we do have a number of really interesting organisms that you wouldn't think are in there. So for instance, like this mussel, this floater that's um, depicted on the left, uh, we do not have a lot of them, but they, they're not in high abundance. Um, it would be nice if we could restore their populations. Uh, but if you also look closely, um, you'll see actually sponges on the, on the shell there. So we also have uh, freshwater sponges as well and a bunch of number of other things. And if you want a species list of this, of this uh, just email me and I could uh, email it to you.
So looking at the nine different sites and looking at the abundance across the sites, the question that you first want to ask is abundance the same across all sites. And just by looking at this bar graph right here, we can see that that's not the case. And secondly, when we're looking at this sort of stuff, we want to see, well, is there are there locations where there is relatively low diversity, which would kind of shine a light on it to, well, we need to find out what's going on in those areas. Why are we seeing that low abundance, low diversity? Um, and is that um, correlated with anything that we see with uh, water quality. So here, I don't know if you remember looking at that phosphorus graph that we had the highest phosphorus at site B. Well, when we looked at the abundances within our leaf packs in that same year, it just so happened that the site that had the highest, radically highest phosphorus also has the lowest diverse um, abundance. Now, what the connection between those um, things are, is that just spurious um, possibly, but it's this sort of information allows um, John and I to go to these locations, investigate them with more detail um, to, to try and understand why is it that at site B we're seeing such a lower diversity relative to everything else. This is looking at, um, I, I apologize if I mixed up abundance and diversity, the, the last graph we were looking at is abundance. This is looking at diversity. So the number of different families of benthic macroinvertebrates that were in the leaf packs at different sites. And these are called um, rare faction curves, which allows you to do comparisons at the rate at which species are accumulated. So basically the ones with the lowest diversity are BGF. So they just have the slowest rate of species accumulation um, as compared to our, our high uh, species rich, uh, family rich sites, which are E, I, and H. Um, again, going back to the, uh, that high phosphorus site B, B has low abundance, but when we look at the diversity, it also has a, a relatively smaller number of different uh, invertebrates actually existing in that area. So by combining this um, diversity data with the abundance data, um, it's really pointing John and I to um, look at site B. The interesting thing is site B is in Yonkers. So that forces us to mobilize people across um, boundaries, but it's, it's doable. Now, when I was talking before about connecting the water quality data with the actual diversity data, what, what we're doing is we're creating a bunch of different models. These are very simple uh, regression models at first. So we took all the different variables and we seen which one was more closely related to Shannon diversity. Shannon diversity is um, a metric that describes uh, the, the, how rich the community is. So how many different things were found there. Um, it also takes into account a bit of the evenness, but you could just think about it as the higher the Shannon diversity, the more things, the more different things you'll find in that area. And out of all the different parameters that we had, uh, our mean temperature in our system actually had a fairly good, there's one outlier standing across, but in terms of the R squared value and how close these points are to that trend line, this is a fairly predictive model that we have here. Um, something to see going forward in the future. Does this hold true year to year to year? But essentially, if you give us the temperature, we could pretty, pretty accurately tell you how many different families of invertebrates, at least for the year 2019 in, in the system. And looking at the different actual types of invertebrates, um, I mentioned a couple uh, before, but one of the crustaceans that um, I'm kind of interested in in the groups of crustaceans are these crayfish. Uh, we have confirmed two different species. Um, however, our um, rusty creek uh, cheeked crayfish is um, based on just the abundances we've been finding it um, is likely going to be extirpated. Um, so moving forward, um, thinking about ways of how to uh, figure out what its habitat's needs are and are, is there anything we can do uh, to create more habitat to reduce its capacity. The White River crayfish, which is the much larger one, is just a more behaviorally dominant species. And what I've seen from keeping them together in captivity, the, uh, the submissiveness of the rusty doesn't allow it to be as competitively strong as the White River crayfish. 
Um, and then just starting to think about basically the biology of these things. So going from thinking about the community scale, um, an assemblage of different species to really looking at one species and trying to understand its biology a little more. Um, I ran experiments with a student, uh, Stephanie Roberts and Dr. Michael Judge over at Manhattan College, where we were able to um, show that um, crayfish that were developed on white uh, sand as compared to black sand ended up with two different colors. So you can see the one on the, on the left, on the top left, that was raised on black sand same species, um, same age, and then the one on the right, which is a lot lighter colored. So these crayfish are capable of uh, changing their colors through their lifetime to match their backgrounds. Um, looking up in the literature, um, there was like one paper, I think in the 19, early 1900s that kind of poked at this, that this may be the case, but I'm pretty sure this is the first time anyone shows this species is capable of, of actually um, having this sort of plasticity in their coloration, which is really cool. And some other, um, just other experiment that we did was back to the muscles as we were interested in, because there's just so much work and talk about the benefits of oysters in the harbor that we're equally interested in the benefits of mussels in freshwater systems. And we were able to show through um, laboratory experiments that the mussels, just a single mussel uh, was um, capable of statistically uh, significantly reducing the amount of turbidity over time as compared to a control. And that was just a single mushroom. You know, I want to think and and extrapolate out uh, what what can what can 500 of, the, of these uh, of these muscles do in a system. Uh, so moving on to terrestrial biodiversity. So that was the work that we've been doing in Tibbetts Brook and Van Cortlandt uh, Lake, which is Hester Imperial Pond. And now we'll be moving up into the forest because uh, Van Cortlandt Park not only has some wonderful wetlands but also has some really awesome forest ecosystems. Um, so these were the sites that were basically uh, studied for a terrestrial biodiversity study area. Uh, the biodiversity that I was looking at again was the arthropods. So looking in specifically looking at the ants uh, within uh, the system. Why I'll, I'll, I'll explain later, but we went, I went through and did some trapping in the Northwest Forest, uh, did work in Vault Hill and the Tibbetsburg floodplain and the Croton Woods. And this allowed for a variable habitat structure to begin to look at specificity, habitat use, habitat ecology. The Northwest Forest has a slightly different plant community than Vault Hill as is different than the floodplain as is slightly different than Croton Woods. So having this expanse allowed us to be able to look at different habitats and how that influenced, in this case, the ants that live in the area. So the objective was to go and put and use pitfall traps. So pitfall trap is basically a cup that you sink into the ground and basically fill it up with some liquid, things fall in it, and you're able to collect it. It's a passive method for um, collecting um, loads of different ground dwelling uh, arthropods. And so 60 pitfall traps were placed around the park in total. Um, and in within each one of those locations, an eight by eight meter plot was placed and a bunch of different variables and uh, data was recovered. So we looked at the DBH of the trees and the plots, the tree diversity, the understory cover, the midstory cover, the soil chemistry, the coarse weighted debris, uh, the decay of the coarse weighted debris, the rock cover, soil moisture, you guys could read. And statistical models basically were put into place to um, look at and connect the same way we did with the um, parameters and the water quality, looking at how that mixed with the abundance and diversity of the benthics, we're doing the same sort of modeling exercise to look at, are there any um, clear predictive um, variables to understanding the community composition of ants in the park? Um, also, I just want to, I guess, also mention that um, it's ants, why, why ants? Well, uh, 
they have a, an amazing array of ecological services. I mean, we're talking about dead wood decomposition and they're generating our soils in the absence of Asian jumping worms and, and, and uh, other things. We're really looking and, and benefiting from ants, um, you know, with, uh, creating, uh, aerating and developing our soils. Um, they're seed dispersers. So there's no number, number of plants. I mean, the majority of our spring ephemerals are gonna be dispersed by ants. They produce a seed that has a little uh, lipid packet on it called an oleosome. It entices the ant to go and pick it up. They pick it up, they get the reward, but they also move it. They tend to move it into their nests. Ant nests tend to have slightly higher nitrogen. So there's this interesting, you know, um, seed dispersal role that they're playing in our forest. And they're also scavengers. Um, so we would be uh, up to here with um, the carcasses of, of uh, different uh, arthropods and, and things if, if ants weren't constantly a conveyor belt for taking material and distributing it into, their, into themselves, into their colonies. And we're looking at close to 10 billion ants on the island of Manhattan. Um, so it's really, we are a, 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 um, a city of ants, and it's also to mention that uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, ant biologists, no, the greatest ant biologist of all time died um, a couple days ago, and uh, his name, Dr. Edward O. Wilson, if you guys do not know him, uh, you should, and so please look him up, he, uh, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for him. Uh, I definitely wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So here, what we're looking at is on the side, this is a, it's referred to as a principal components analysis. Each location in the park is denoted by a different color. So we've got Vault Hill in purple, we've got Northwest Forest in blue, we've got the floodplain in Tibbetts in black and Croton in red. And what the cell analysis is doing is, is it, it's basically taking into account each location and its characteristics. Those characteristics are the set of species of ants that are located. And then it's looking at to see, is there a lot of overlap in that composition across these different sites? So if you see a lot of overlap in the dots and the graph, that means that the composition is rather similar. What this is showing us is that purple is basically almost non overlapping with the rest of the system. And so what that is saying is that Vault Hill, which is purple, has a completely unique species of ant community present there. That being said, if we lose Vault Hill, and we could lose Vault Hill not by just it being lost through some crazy phenomenon, when we wake up, it's just not there, but literally the, through succession, as that habitat begins to close up as it becomes part of the forest interior, as it becomes less open, that um, we will essentially lose that type of habitat. And based on this analysis, if we lose that open space, we will lose a completely unique uh, assemblage of different ants. This also speaks to how we should treat, conserve, and think about open spaces uh, that are akin to the vegetation community that we see in Vault Hill because these things are likely extremely important habitats for creating and generating ant conservation uh, in the city. And like I said before, um, we, we may see them on the sidewalk and not give them any thought. However, within our forest, there are an integral ecosystem engineer and understanding their habitat ecology and what we can do in restoration will only help the system as a whole. Lastly, something to mention about the ant studies is that the most abundant ant that I'm finding really in our traps is actually sadly an invasive species, Nylandaria flavipes from Asia. Um, not only does it seem to be the most abundant, but looking and doing some behavioral examinations on its dominance, it tends to get to food resources first. It overwhelms those food resources. So its ability to exchange information within the colony is seems to be more optimized for foraging and getting a large number of ants to that resource, overwhelming it so other species don't have access to it. And that seems to be a strategy of N. flavipes. 
And one of the things that they also can be decoupling is the ability for these native ants to disperse the seeds. If this, native, if this invasive ant gets to that seed first and eats that oleosome, that lipid packet, our native species seem don't want anything to do with it. Um, so moving forward, I, um, I think I would love to get an Nylandaria flavipes um, in the in the minds of of the parks workers um, of, of of the parks department, so they understand that there is a forest pest that is an ant that is likely in every single um, park in New York City, but no one knows about it. The go looking at the modeling and the habitat ecology of the ants in the system. I was interested to see basically how they were responding to the vegetation community. And so what I did is I created this complexity score. So I would go to those locations where the pit fat traps was. And if it had a low invasive cover and a high um, na native diversity, um, basically it would get scored three, okay? And a low mean complexity score, okay, means that there was a high invasive cover and a low amount of diversity. So as we're moving on the x-axis there, as we're moving closer to three, uh, you could really think about it as the invasives are shrinking and the native diversity is increasing. And, like, and so what we're seeing is that the ant species, the community is responding. It seems to be responding and not only is its highest where there's the most native diversity and lowest invasives, but it also seems to be responding to that structure in the understory much more than the midstory. Um, this is important because we do a lot of midstory, we do a lot of canopy restoration and modification, and we're really not thinking so much um, when we're doing restoration in terms of the understory, we more or less let the seed bank and the regen natural process regeneration um, colonize those areas. But with this information and also knowing that there is this intimate relationship between seed dispersal and plant communities and the understory, that moving forward, we should think about how we can better restore and modify our understory systems in our parks not only our mid-story and canopy, just because of this information is basically the ants are, are responding very, very strongly to, to uh, that structure in the understory. And in particular, our removal of invasive species and our increase of natives in the understory is increasing ant species richness in the park. So we may not see our results in the fauna, um, but the ants are, are really showing us that our work is actually benefiting the diversity in the system. And we're looking to basically integrate this into a much larger framework that the city has. It's the integration into the natural areas. Um, Conservancy's rapid site assessment protocol. This is a protocol essentially that's a before and after assessment. Go in before to a site that is completely infested with vines, figure out what species of plants are there. Go in after the restoration, all the removal is done, and this is a way to actually gauge success. Now, they're just looking at plants. An ecosystem is more than plants. And so what we've been working on is, is this pitfall trap a quick and viable method to rapidly get information on the arthropod um, community and how does that integrate a map with the plant information. And as a whole, knowing the arthropods and the plants, will that give us a better understanding and all the literature is saying it will, uh, will that give us a better understanding of our success in restoring these spaces? Um, because it's not only the native plants that also end up recolonizing these sites, but also native arthropods. However, in the absence of this information, we're really running blind um, in terms of these little things that, that run uh, these, these ecosystems. 
basically a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of geniuses over in California developed this godlike uh, technology uh, called iNaturalist. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but it's something that we're really looking into in starting to integrate seriously into our research, our mapping of species, our understanding, restoration, um, uh, mo uh, moving forward. And I do have a project for the park. I, I basically go on to iNaturalist. The instructions are over here. Download the app. If you navigate to the projects and you can search Van Cortlandt Biodiversity Project and, and basically download that. And if you're in Van Cortlandt, you take a picture, all this stuff gets sent to one location. Um, and we're definitely over 15,000 observations. But some of the things that we're starting to do with that information is I've got grad student interns from Lehman College working on creating programs where we can extract that information, that point data, and begin to create some interesting uh, spatial um, uh, maps. And hopefully that'll allow us to understand uh, the distribution of these things a little more. So what we're looking at here is the our fungal observations. So this is everything from most majority are, are pictures of mushrooms that were taken. So each red dot is a fungal observation taken on iNaturalist. Um, and then the the map on the 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 right interpolates everything and creates a, a heat map uh, to show you where the densest um, locations are. And this is interesting because we gave this to the New York Mycological Society. So how would they, how would we actually use this? Well, now the Mycological Society knows um, don't sample in the red. You guys have done enough in the red, go to those light green spots. Um, and that way, um, by producing these maps, giving it to organizations like the Mycological Society, now that they'll be able to build up, help them to assist a bigger picture and to expand and create a, a more higher resolution map for the distribution of fungi across the park. And we've got it to where we could basically do it with anything. Um, we have, a, we need more observations of deer in the park, but this is the same thing, extracting the iNaturalist data. And interestingly enough here, um, you can see that there, if you follow the, the heat map and you kind of look at the trails and you could see that the movement and activity of deer, it's not that random. It seems to actually be um, confined to borders. It's confined to trails. It's on the border of the park. Um, and so moving forward, how do, you know, using this sort of information, we could uh, maybe plant uh, stuff that deer like to eat where we know that they are, preventing them from going into the interior and eating the stuff that we plant. And since uh, November 10th, we've had 20,000 observations plus. Um, we're almost at, we're probably at 2,000 species now. Um, 511 observers. Um, so it's really just, it hasn't been a long time since we've had this up. And the fact that we've already have over 20,000 observations um, is, is it, that would have taken me 10 years uh, to do something like that. And lastly, I'm going to quickly just discuss a restoration research project on Japanese knotweed. So like I was saying before, um, Japanese knotweed, it's this noxious invasive plant. It tends to grow in riparian zones. It has a rhizome that can extend, you know, six feet down. It's colonial, so it's they're all virtually connected to one another. Um, it grows vegetatively and it has an extremely fast growth rates. Um, and because of that, it tends to outcompete things in these riparian zones really easily. So you end up with these monocultures. And I'll be discussing a solarization experiment. So that's using essentially tarp and, and elevated temperatures um, to help reduce it. And I'll also be talking about um, the measurement and some data collection preliminarily that I started this past summer on water chestnut density, um, which is an invasive aquatic plant that um, we work with uh, to remove that's choking out the lake. 
So these in the pictures, so we'll start at the 30. So basically there were 36 plot locations that went from the Bronx to Yonkers. Um, in each one of those locations, I measured the stem density. So we have data on the um, number of stems per square meter in these plots. But I also have data on the rhizome biomass um, in, a, in basically five liters of soil um, and looking at the, the mass of rhizome that's in there. So we have data on the, what's going on on the surface and also what's going on the below ground. Um, it was important to get those rhizome samples because um, previous research really um, focused on the above ground biomass and really didn't look at the, the rhizomes of knotweed. H however, it's the main uh, way in which this plant is not only colonizing new areas, but um, uh, growing as well. So, and then also, lastly, we reseeded and planted the areas and assessed for native plant regeneration. So depicted, this is the knotweed, um, the solarization project. So on the left is a site that was solarized for a year. So that was a tarp, some very low tech tarps. And the idea is that when we put the tarp down, the temperature will be elevated to a temperature that just makes the rhizomes either induce mortality or it's become so physiological stressful that um, they're just not going to grow and will be outcompeted. Um, so you can see that just visually uh, it's pretty stark difference and is fairly successful in terms of just one year. Uh, two years will probably be even more successful, but you can see the control picture on the right where you can almost see a complete monoculture um, ex, uh, except for the Eastern Agundo that we've planted there of knotweed. As compared to the left, uh, where you could see the, a, another Eastern Agundo that we've uh, planted there as well, uh, but you could also not see any knotweed barely in the actual frame. And there is some other species starting to regenerate up from the, from the bottom there. Graphically, um, it looks like this. So just preliminarily counting, going in, looking at the different species. When looking at the number of plant species in the control versus the solarized, the solarized had a considerably a statistically higher uh, number of, of plants uh, species, which is pointing to the direction that uh, one year's worth of solarization uh, does have an consistent uh, um, ability to knock down knotweed, but also uh, create the conditions for native plant regeneration um, to the point where we're looking at, you know, uh, we've got around maybe like three to four plants in our control sites. Meanwhile, we're getting, you know, eight, 10 in our solarized locations. Because the main mechanism of the solarization and the mortality that's induced is temperature driven, that I looked into the literature to see if there were any, does anybody know what temperature when reached actually induces death in these knotweed rhizomes? And um, funny enough, I really couldn't find, I couldn't find anything. Um, and so I think this may be one of the first times um, this sort of metric has been explored. And so basically what I did very crudely, I'm trying to figure out how to make this more realistic, but essentially took rhizome material, placed it in an oven uh, for 24 hours. That oven was put at different temperatures. So we had controls that didn't go into an oven. We had 30 degrees centigrade, 45 degrees centigrade, uh, 50 degrees centigrade and 60 degrees centigrade. Um, after being exposed to the temperatures in the oven for 24 hours, we then took them out. I took them out and, and did this with Giselle Cabrera, who was um, uh, interned from uh, Mount Holyoke and replanted them. And then we waited to see if anything would grow back. 30 rhizome at 30 degrees C, 100% grew back. 45, 100%, 50, 100%. 60, as soon as it reached about 60 uh, degrees centigrade, we, we saw um, absolutely no growth. Um, the temperature that was reached underneath the tarp was a, 
about 45 at its highest. So moving forward, what we have to think about specifically for knotweed and solarization is how do we achieve 60 degrees centigrade? How do we elevate our temperatures about 15 to 20 more degrees in order to get 100% mortality. Albeit 45 degrees does allow for um, regeneration of natives and the knocking back of knotweed. It seems that if we want 100% reduction, we're going to at least need to elevate temps by about 15, 20 more degrees to reach that 60 degree temperature for knotweed root mortality. Antidotally, um, as soon as we, the first year we did this, as soon as we removed the knotweed, a uh, big female snapping turtle came in, laid her eggs right at the site, was looking at it. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, looking for, you know, ectothermic animals or looking for open sunny locations, a dense patch of knotweed is not that it, inducive for laying eggs, remove it, it is. So essentially, I'd be interested to see how uh, turtle habitat and nesting habitat is influenced by knotweed restoration, um, especially in riparian zones. Um, and just moving on to the water chestnut. So water chestnut, again, is a invasive aquatic plant. It lives um, in, in our park, it lives in Tibbetts Brook and in the Hester Imperial Pond. And we've been working tirelessly to remove it um, uh, mechanically uh, through basically going and picking it. Um, but we really had little to no information on what its ecology was in the system. So this past summer started to collect data. And what we found is a, little, a lot of interesting um, information, like for instance, that the density of the rosettes, so the rosette is the, the composite of all the leaflets um, that composes a single water chestnut, um, that their density is fairly closely related to the water depth of the system. Um, and so moving forward, thinking about not only just hand removal and pulling, but there's also modifications that could be done to the actual habitat itself in order to reduce the density. So for example, um, a very shallow urban lake is going to have a higher density of rosettes. How can we reduce that shallowness? Well, through dredging in a sense. And, and so what this is suggesting to me is that if we really want to manage uh, the chestnut in the system that we not only have to do pulling, but we have to couple that with habitat modifications, uh, primarily um, through dredging uh, to increase water depth. Um, we tend to think about organisms as basically these passive things that are responding to conditions in the environment. Uh, but organisms are also actively altering and changing and modifying those very conditions in their environment. And so because we were out there hand pulling, um, it was very noticeable that when we were in these really thick patches that the water was very warm, we would be on the canoes, we would be slightly outside the patches. It was, it was, a lot cooler. And so I was wondering if this was actually a statistically significant difference in temperature. And it turns out it, it was that the temperature is far more elevated, a lot higher um, underneath the uh, patches of, of uh, trapanid tans than in the open water. Um, so we also know that temperature has a per large predictive capacity with the benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, so essentially, this is uh, chestnut is is having a large effect on the temperature, um, and not only will removing it have an influence on the plant community and things like the nutrients and the eutrophication, uh, but it's also going to help um, buffer 
the urban heat island effect because right now it's just exacerbating it. And so we're looking at a significant effect on lake temperature. Water temperature is intimately related to the dissolved oxygen in the system. Colder water is going to hold more oxygen. And so as a function of having higher temperatures underneath those uh, patches, we also have lower oxygen. Lower oxygen means that the fish in the system are going to have, it's gonna be not ideal for anything that's aerobically respirating, especially as these patches become larger and more dense. As was shown in the regression model, water depth is, is an important factor and we should consider that when we're thinking about moving forward in restoring the system. And sadly, on average, we found about 900 per seeds per square meter produced in the summer of 2021. Um, so again, that's 900 seeds per square meter. So just think about the whole size of the lake and do some math. Uh, the dormancy of these seeds can be up to more than 10 years. Um, so that's why I also think that we have to push for, for dredging in this system as well, because we've got such a large seed output that we really have to think about it, that our pulling has to supersede the seed output. And if that's not the case, we're running on a treadmill. And just antidotally again, there are um, species of leaf beetle that would otherwise be feeding on the spatter dock, but has jumped over to, and this has been reported before, but it's just a nice to know that we do have insects also helping us um, remove water chestnut from the system. And then lastly, I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, some work on soil geochemistry. And so like we were saying, we have this beautiful forest and this forest is so, but everything is uh, so dependent upon the soil. However, uh, we did not necessarily have a good understanding of what the pollution was uh, and what the elemental structure was in the soil. So we used XRF and elemental quantification for um, over at Lehman College to do this analysis. Um, I sampled the soil at the 60 sites that we also took all the arthropod data. And I'm currently working on generating um, a bunch of predictive models for ant species uh, richness as a function of the soil chemistry. So the uh, graph on the left, it's a little confusing, but essentially we're just looking to see if anything is really correlated with one another. Um, so for in this case, if you find a lot of zinc, we also tend to find a lot of copper. Um, so that was one really tight correlation. Um, on the right here, we've got a table that looks at and uses enrichment factor. So essentially we took measurements from the bedrock, we understood its concentration of what about 15 elements. We took samples from the surface and the difference between the bedrock composition and the surface would give us an estimate to how enriched certain materials were at the surface as compared to what we'd see actually in the bedrock. And what we were actually able to find is that out of all the elements that we measured, titanium has actually a moderate enrichment um, in, the, in the soil. Um, what this suggests is that moving forward, we really should look at the influence of titanium in the soil on things like plant development, nectar production, and even pollination. So that means having a bunch of garden experiments, pots, having different concentrations of titanium and growing plants and seeing what the effect is. There's not a lot of information on it. Um, we, this data, Pro, uh, provided here tells us that uh, we are experiencing pollution from a, a titanium pollution. And so just the lack of research, um, more, uh, more exploration should be done in this area to, to look at the impact of titanium. And then on a global scale, this table, bunch of different cities in the left here, 
we've got um, everything from Glasgow to places in China. Um, and then we've got Van Cortland Park down at the bottom there. Um, so when we did this global comparison, um, copper, Van Cortland Park registered um, number one. Zinc registered number one. Um, manganese uh, number two. So although the titanium is enriched, um, and that should be something that we should be concerned about um, on just a global comparative scale that we tend to have a large influence from the likely the highways, historical dumping, uh, historical land use, and the, the roads that go through uh, the system. Uh, we are seem to be more polluted than places in Hong Kong, in Bangkok. Um, so this is uh, uh, information that needs to be understood in the context of ecosystem development and, and restoration. Is this buffering our capacity to be successful in our restoration? So these, understanding this information, I hope to, to integrate that moving forward. And that's it. So basically I'm always open to like talking about this stuff. It's all I kind of think about. It's all I want to think about. Um, please reach out, email me. Um, I see most of you anyway in the park, uh, but uh, thank you for listening to me. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, Alex, we have, we're a little over, but I think we have time for one question. And uh, Demetrius came up with a good question in the, in the chat that I think would be worth uh, having you clarify. <laughs> What's that? How much? Oh, it's, oh, it's just five minutes. Um, all right, so, uh, so can, going back to the, the not wheat study, can you clarify the difference between what was seen in the, um, in the solarization experiment versus the 24 hour oven study? So when you were, when you were discussing it, you showed um, success out in the field um, where the solarization seemingly worked at 45 degrees Celsius or heating up the soil to 45 degrees Celsius whereas the oven experiment needed results at 60 degrees Celsius. Can you clarify that a bit? We did not get a, so can you hear me? Yep. We did not get 100% in the field um, with the 45 um, degrees uh, Celsius. And so you can't see it in the photo. There are little tiny um, knotweeds kind of coming up. Um, and so that's gonna require, although, that makes our job a lot easier. We have extremely reduced density that's gonna make actually removing everything um, much more labor intensive. Um, but we did not get 100% death at any of our sites because we did not exceed that, that um, temperature. And my, my concern is that the oven is not realistic. My concern is that the oven is not actually simulating temperature increase underneath the tarp. And so what I want to do moving forward is to think about how I could create a more realistic um, scenario. I even thought about boiling it. You know, maybe that doesn't have the deleterious effects that putting it in an oven would. And so I think even doing that and comparing it uh, would be worthwhile. It'd be interesting to see that boiling it at 60 in oven, we, it'd be really interesting to, to sort of add to that um, and do more experiments. So more definitely needs to be done, but um, also talking to Felicity, she had spoken about um, just pasteurization temps. Um, it, it, it seems that pasteurization temps uh, are around 60 degrees. So, um, it may not be, another thing, it may not be specific to knotweed. It just may, we just may be kill everything. <laughs> converging on something that is just a, a very general um, temp. Uh, but I would love to, more comparative stuff needs to be done. Um, but my hope is that this, there's some actual reality here. It's just not all, um, and, and uh, that this temperature, and now that we know this temperature, we can work on elevating temps underneath the tarp 
as our main objective moving forward. And then last thing, Alex, uh, before we let you leave, is um, the, can you, can you talk about jumping worms? What about them? Uh, any, any thoughts for the, uh, thoughts for the future on what you would like to study about them or right, anything we're going to be doing here in Vancouver? There are tons of forest pests in the forest that no one's doing anything about. Um, um, but the worms seem to be having one of the, it, it, like I was talking to John earlier today, I was like, in ecology, you look at something and you're like, is this actually happening? Is this interaction strong enough where like it'll show up on a graph and look totally different? Um, but these worms are definitely doing something. I don't want to necessarily speak in like the negative positive, but they are increasing erosion. They're increasing the amount of decomposition that's happening on the leaf litter um, as a function of that. Um, you're losing an insulation layer. That means that evaporation at the soil layer is increasing and we're likely drying our soils out quicker. That's gonna have a large effect on the arthropods and the uh, ability for seeds to actually respond. Um, they're influencing the chemistry of it. So they're changing and I believe they're creating slightly more alkaline conditions. Um, they're increasing the release and um, movement of nitrogen through the system into our watersheds. So it's no longer necessarily a slow release of nitrogen, it's this really rapid quick um, fertilization release. And their ability to disrupt mycorrhizal structures is probably uh, happening as well. Um, if they're going in and mechanically disturbing um, stuff at, uh, in the soil and at the surface, but also through consumption, um, they're definitely messing with my, my uh, hyphae and, and mycelial networks and um, the, uh, the, the mycorrhizal networks, uh, which, okay, mycorrhizae are, are fungi that help plants out. And that relationship may be um, decoupled um, moving, moving forward. And yeah, there's, uh, there's endless, um, things I could talk about worms. Cool. Well, thanks Alex. Are really they ending up on our shoes? Are we the ones dispersing them? Like, uh, you know, <laughs> on our shovels, do we need to be cleaning everything more? Like, what about the nurseries? Are the nurseries dispersing these things across every park when the, the plants are delivered? Um, there's a lot of low hanging fruit with these jumping worms, I think. Um, and so if anyone's interested in, in, in working or doing that, um, John and I and 